I want to welcome all of you here to uh, to this worship in uh, in the gym on this rather rainy and uh, dreary Sunday. But whether you are a longtime member or first-time visitor, welcome. Uh, I see we have a, a couple of visitors from uh, from Toronto. Uh, Alan's uh, brother Gary and uh, and Lydia Harder are here. Uh, welcome. And whether you are whether you come with joy, with sorrow, seeking answers, seeking solace, or seeking a place to sing, welcome. All are welcome to worship here and fully participate as God makes no distinction between people. So we strive to do the same here and in the world. This morning, may we sense and encounter God's Spirit with us. Today, we are beginning a new uh, worship series called Stories of Faith. The Bible has many stories of faith. There are stories of devotion and desperation, stories of transformation and salvation, stories of extravagance and reluctant faith, to name a few. And each Sunday, until the end of June, our focus in worship will be on the different stories, the different biblical stories of faith. And today, our story will be on the book of Ruth in the Hebrew Bible. It's a great story of relationship. And we will, not, we will not only listen to these biblical stories of faith, but I'm hoping we're going to hear some of our own. At each table, you will find a small piece of paper with three statements on it. And each of them is meant to generate some table discussion on today's theme, a story of relationship. And a little later in worship, there will be time for us to have conversations around the table on some of these uh, statements. One, two, or all three of them. You can choose. But for the other Sundays, my hope is to have at least one person each Sunday share their story of faith and worship. And I've already, already tapped a few people on the shoulder, inviting you to share your story of faith. And I thank all of those who have responded. But I'm still looking for more. So if you are interested at some point in time to share your story of faith, please contact me after worship or sometime this week. And just a few announcements. Uh, just a reminder that following worship, we are going to eat lunch together and then begin also table discussions about church vision. And then also, uh, a little bit after lunch, uh, faith exploration class is going to start in the fire side room. And then on a personal note, I did meet with uh, the oncologist on Friday, and the plan is to start uh, uh, radiation treatments, but no set date has been firmed up. So I'll be sharing some updates probably in the next uh, once I know more. And then on Friday, I received an email from Alan Harder uh, saying that his brother, Ellen, passed away. 
Don lived in the Nine Hole, and that's the reason why Gary and Lydia are here. Uh, Don is Alan and Gary's their second brother to die in eight months. So uh, please uh, pray for the family, the Harder family. Now, would you join me in this morning's call to worship that is on the screen? People of God, look about and see the faces of those we know and love. Neighbors and friends, sisters and brothers, at the community of kindred hearts. People of God, look about and see the faces of those we hardly know. Strangers, soldiers, forgotten friends, the ones who need an outstretched hand. People of God, look about you and see all the images of God assembled here. In me, in you, in each of us, God's Spirit shines for all to see. People of God, come. Let us share our story. Today with Morning Has Broken, which I thought was a really appropriate song for, for a springtime uh, worship service. Um, feel free to stand uh, if you like around your tables or stay seated with others more comfortable.
faith comes from the book of Ruth, um, first in chapter 1 and then in chapter 4. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will, be, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Chapter 4, 13 and 15. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The woman, the woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth.
Chrissy. Malika. Shaka. Jenna. Mahalo.
know for sure. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to take good care of ourselves, good care of each other, and good care of nature too. So that's why today we are going to plant some seeds. And when we take good care of these seeds, they're actually going to turn into bees. Now, these are fake. I tried to find real ones, but I couldn't. But they're going to turn into bees. So each of you are going to get to plant a seed, and if you take good care of it, that's what's going to happen to it. How do you know? Do you already have a sunflower? Do you? That's great. Maybe you could add this one to it, hey? How do you take care of your sunflower? Watering it. For sure, it needs water. What else does it need? Sun. Sun, for sure. And when it gets big, what does it need to do? We're going to plant them in pots like. In a pot like this. Can it live in this forever? No. Okay, what needs to happen, Shaka? Perfect. And you can plant it in your garden, or you can bring it back to the church garden and put it in there if you'd like to, for sure. You know, the story today that Pastor Rod's going to talk about and that Pastor Rachel just read is a story about two women. And there's lots of names in that Bible verse. I don't know if you've heard all of them, but I want to talk to you about two people, and then we're going to plant our seeds. Ruth and Naomi. And this is a story about how they took good care of each other. And that's what I want you to remember today. Ruth stayed with her mother-in-law and didn't leave her, even though her mother-in-law said, go, go back to your family. Ruth said, no, I'm going to stay with you and I'm going to take really good care of you. So let's do that. So we'll play a song now. Um, if we're all up there, ready? Take Good Care. It's by Brian Moore and Suderman. Feel free to sing along if you'd like. We're going to plant our seeds and then we'll go on. Come back. 
Alright, so we're going to sing, um, this is a new song but a familiar melody, it's to the tune of In the Bleak Midwinter, um, but it's a story that references, references these two women that we will talk to, Naomi and Ruth, and talks about being there um, for each other. Um, I think it's really, really beautiful words, set to a really beautiful tune. So, uh, yeah, please join, join us in singing, please stand if, if you're comfortable. Bless the arms that comfort. around. 
you will notice its thick, sword-like leaves. These beautiful, beautiful words of loyalty and faithfulness in the Book of Ruth are not from the dreamy eyes of the groom to the bride on a wedding day, but Ruth towards her mother-in-law. These words in Ruth contrast sharply with our cultural stereotypes of mother-in-laws, which can be summed up in this plant, the mother-in-law tongue. The story of Ruth and Naomi is an incredible story of relationship, with good reason. In case you've forgotten some of the details, let's just briefly recall that story once again. The story of Ruth takes place during the time of the judges. Judges were charismatic leaders who rose up occasionally to help the people, these different tribes of Israel, get something done. And famine strikes the land, however. Elimech, the, from the tribe of Judah, Judah, takes his wife Naomi and their two sons, Malone and Chilion, to live in the country of Moab, a country east of the Dead Sea. While there, Elimelech dies, and Naomi and her two sons stay, and eventually the two sons marry, two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. Ten years go by, and the two sons, Malone and Chilion, die. By this time, the famine has ended, and Naomi plans to return back to her home. And she urges her daughter-in-laws to stay in Moab, because she knows they have absolutely no future and no security back in her home country. And they protest, saying they want to stay with Naomi. And she reminds them to go back to their families. Orpah finally relents and stays with her family in Moab. But Ruth insists on following her mother-in-law, Naomi, with these moving and beautiful words. And Ruth follows Naomi into a very uncertain future. But the story, as the story goes, the Lord rewards Ruth with safety and security and future as she marries Boaz, a wealthy man who is related to Naomi through Emelech. Boaz and Ruth have a son, Obed. Obed marries and then has a son, Jesse. Jesse marries and has several sons, the youngest of which is David, the one who would become king of Israel. Of course, this isn't the end of the story, at least for those of us who love biblical genealogies, and I'm sure there's just a ton of you. We know from Matthew's Gospel that David's lineage extends to Joseph, who just happened to be the father of Jesus. While we esteem Ruth so highly because of her steadfastness and loyalty, I'm struck by how God used this simple relationship between these two women Moabite woman and a woman from Israel and turned it into such a strong link in the biblical story of salvation. Can you think of such a story in your life?
I have a Chinese friend whose name is Guo Xi. He lives in Beijing and is a successful international lawyer. And I got to know him when I lived there. When I met Guo Xi several years ago, he told me he had a deep, deep desire to do whatever he could to help Mennonite work in China. And why would he say that to me, an MCC worker living and working there? But before I tell you about Guo Xi, I need to go back a bit and tell you about Guo Xi's grandfather, as he's an important part of this story. Guo Xi's grandfather's English name was Stephen, Stephen Wong. Stephen Wong was born in 1905, during the last days of the Qing Dynasty in China, and he died in 1997. Stephen Wong's mother was a peasant woman with bound feet, and his father was a Confucian scholar. Stephen Wong's parents, they became Christians in the early part of the 20th century, and then evangelists for the Mennonite mission in what is now Henan province. It's up there. But then in 1927, both, both of them were shot by wandering bandits during a preaching tour. Now, Guo Xu's grandfather, Stephen Wong, studied in the Huamei School, which was founded by Mennonite missionaries, by the Mennonite missionary E.G. Kaufman. Stephen Wong and one of his classmates, James Leo, showed great promise in their studies and were invited to attend Bethel College in Newton, Kansas. Stephen Wong graduated from there in 1932. Fast forward to the Cultural Revolution in 19, starting in 1966. It was a turbulent and violent time, which lasted until 1976. And because Stephen Wong's uh, foreign education, his entire family was labeled a were labeled righteous, which at that time was a very bad thing to be labeled with. And so Washu's parents were then forced to leave the family, go and labor in the countryside. As Washu was still a child, he was raised by his grandparents. For 10 years, Washu was deeply influenced by his grandparents. Now back to the grandfather, Stephen Wong. Back in the 1920s, I imagine that the Mennonite missionaries wanted to train Stephen Wong in the university so that eventually he would return and take over the leadership at the Kwame School. I don't think Mennonite missionaries ever imagined, ever dreamt that their relationship with Stephen Wong in the 20s would have an impact, not in the 1920s or 30s or 40s, but in the 21st century when I lived there. My relationship and friendship with Guo Xu was possible because of the Mennonite missionary's relationship with Stephen Wong almost a hundred years ago. Guo Xu is profoundly grateful for how the Mennonites helped his grandfather get an education, which is something difficult to do in China. And so he provided all kinds of legal help for us and MCC pro bono. All the good work in the name of Christ MCC was able to do in China would not have been possible.
possible otherwise. I imagine Naomi and Ruth, like the Mennonite missionaries with Stephen Wong, never ever dreamt how their simple relationship could be used by God to further God's purpose in the world. The biblical story is all about relationships. God's relationships with the world, God's relationships with you and me, God's relationships with Israel. The Gospels are absolutely chock full of stories about Jesus' relationship with all sorts of people, including tax collectors like Matthew, fishermen like Peter and John and others, like the Samaritan woman or Mary Magdalene. Matthew, the tax collector, began to follow Jesus, but never dreamt how his relationship with Jesus would change his life. He not only became an apostle, but then later wrote a gospel. Likewise, Mary Magdalene never dreamt that her relationship with Jesus would result in her becoming the first witness of the empty tomb, first witness of the resurrection. I have seen the Lord. These words were from the first witnesses to the empty tomb, and the encounter with Jesus summarized what they lived and experienced. They had faith, and from their faith came a group of believers, the church. And from the faith of these early Christians in the church came the testimony to what they had seen and heard. And we find their stories in books of the New Testament. The church today, you and me, stand as a visible reminder to their witness long ago. So God's story continues with you and with me. It continues in our lives, in the stories we share with each other and friends, and in our relationships with those we know and love, and even with those we don't know. What, if anything, do our stories how do they impact others? And our relationships, how will they impact over the long term? And we don't know. And we don't have to know. All of it because God simply calls us to be faithful, to live our lives in hope and trust that God is working in the world and is doing so through you and me. And so the question really is, do we have the eyes to see and to hear it? Thanks be to God. Now, there are, there, it's a little sheet of, a uh, small sheet of paper uh, with some statements on it, and I invite you to uh, have a conversation around your table. Maybe uh, you want to pick one and, uh, and share, yeah, have a conversation. Hello. Uh, I need to cut off our, our story sharing. We'll have more time to talk during, during our lunch. Uh, I felt a fitting, a fitting song to sing after our get to know each other here, get to know our stories of faith, would be one I think most of us in the congregation are familiar with, for we are strangers no more. So again, I invite you to, to sing, um, stand if you like, for we are strangers no more.
Thank you, God, for our relationships. We thank you for relationships with us. How you have called us out of darkness into your light. To be your disciples. To be your people. Living out your calling and will in the world. Thank you that we are here in church. Body and spirit. Thank you for the joy of worshiping you, our creator. God, we also thank you for creating us to have relationships with ourselves, for the gift of self-awareness, self-acceptance, self-care, we thank you. For the gift of embracing our strengths, our limitations, and opportunities to serve and be friends to others, we give you thanks. For the gift of prayer in its many forms, contemplative, meditation, intercession, intercession and thanksgiving, we give thanks. Thank you God for our ability to pray in different ways so that we can foster a healthy dialogue with ourselves and with you. So that we can learn and grow to be more in your image. Relational God, we thank you for our relationships with others. Fathers, mothers, children, grandchildren, friends, church members, and strangers we encounter each day. We thank you for all of those who have nurtured us, been caregivers and teachers and mentors, those who have loved us unconditionally, and those who have made us who we are. Thank you for friends who understand and accept us, friends who challenge us, and the joy of meeting new people. Creator God, we thank you for placing us within the web of creation. We thank you for its beauty and for giving us the privilege of caring for it. Help us to build just relationships with your created order. Help us to live sustainably, rejecting consumerism and the exploitation of creation. Faithful God, sustain our all. We pray with hope because you are already at work through Christ to reconcile all of creation to yourself and to renew all things. Today we pray for those we are in relationship with healing and recovering for Steph Nickel, who is home from the hospital. Peace, comfort, and healing for Peter Bergen and Rudy Kasdorf. Comfort and peace for the Harder family who grieved the death of their brother, Don. Relief from pain for Hans Toes as he awaits treatment for cancer. Healing and reconciliation for broken relationships. Healing for the earth, abused by our economic systems. God, for all of our prayers, we pray in your name. Please stand if you're able and join us in our benediction song. This one is a new one, um, but the melody is fairly simple, and we'll have Kathy play it through once, and then we'll sing it twice.
bow for our table grace. Lord God, we give you thanks that we are able to gather as a community to worship and to eat together. And as we converse around the table, may we also be mindful of those who don't have as much as we do. And I pray these things in your name. Amen.